So, uh, good morning, everyone. This is Cardiac Sciences Grand Rounds, and uh, we have the uh, privilege of having Dr. Mamas again with us. He's been uh, giving us some uh, rounds lately. Uh, I don't know if anyone was at his uh, lecture yesterday at the Approach virtual meeting. It was a great lecture. Now, Dr. Mamas doesn't need a lot of introduction. Those that follow social media should know who he is. Actually, I recommend you guys to see this uh, documentary that we have now in Netflix called Social Dilemma. But anyways, he's very well known. He's a professor of cardiology at Kill Cardiovascular Research Group, which he also directs. He directs the Center for Prognosis Research at the Institute of Primary Care and Health Sciences. He's a professor of interventional cardiology, and he's an honorary professor of population health at the University of Manchester, an adjunct professor of research at Jefferson University in Philadelphia, and a visiting professor in Case Western in Cleveland. Uh, he has over 400 publications and is a very interested nowadays in big data and has made some very interesting uh, contributions on the impact of COVID-19. And uh, we're honored to have him today to give us a lecture on big data to define the impact of COVID-19 and cardiovascular outcomes in the UK. And it's quite relevant for us because as you know, we're going through Morning, an everyone. outbreak right Welcome now. Back to, uh, the so anyways, um, it's a pleasure to have you again here, Mamas, and uh, take it on. So thank you for the kind invitation. Um, it's a real privilege again to give my, I think, third talk now to the Libin. So hopefully I'll get to visit one of these days uh, once the COVID situation allows. So over the next hour or so, I'm going to discuss around the work that we've been doing over the last six months or so, um, utilizing routinely collected healthcare data and the sorts of insights that we've developed over um, and around COVID and in particular, um, how COVID has impacted cardiovascular services nationally. And, you know, look, looking at literature from other places such as the United States and Italy, it's really interesting to see that a lot of what I'm going to discuss today is a recurring theme from healthcare services across the globe. And I, you know, have no doubt that much of what I talk about today will resonate um, with colleagues over there um, who probably have similar experiences, but it'll be great to discuss anyway. So just a little bit about my background. Um, I qualified from the University of Oxford in the year 2000. I took three years out though to undertake a PhD in cardiac electrophysiology um, using um, patch clamping of single isolated heart cells. I then undertook um, training both in general medicine and uh, cardiology in places including Oxford, the Royal Brompton Hospital in London, at the Hammersmith Hospital in London, and in the University of Manchester, and was appointed as an interventional uh, consultant, so an attending from the North American perspective, and an associate professor in 2012. And in 2015, I moved from Manchester to Kiel to be appointed as um, the professor of cardiology there, I'm still a high volume interventional cardiologist. I do 50% uh, practice in interventions and have an active PCI and TAPA program. My main focus in terms of research interests focus around electronic healthcare records and big data and really use this data to inform how um, we can treat patients, their clinical outcomes of patients with cardiovascular disease. So, you know, why electronic healthcare record data? Well, I think it's really important. It's collected as a side effect of medical care. So every time a patient has an interaction with medical care, an electronic healthcare record is created. And it's dynamic. It happens in real time. Um, and it captures um, all aspects of health, anywhere from primary care through to tertiary care. And it really gives us information around um, a patient's passage through the healthcare system and their outcomes. It's unselective, it captures information about the whole population. And I think that's why it's been so useful in its use to gain insights during the COVID pandemic. 
I mean, to give you an example, a randomized control trial will se select um, patients of a very typical phenotype and exclude patients with comorbidities. And really, you can't use randomized controlled trial data to look at the effects of something like COVID on a population level. You know, it would take too long to set up and it wouldn't be receptive enough to be able to capture this information. And again, with large registries, similar sorts of um, limitations apply in that um, prospective large registries take time to set up. And again, they have their own inclusion exclusion criteria. And so it really doesn't provide a snapshot of what's happening at the countrywide and population level, particularly when something like a big healthcare event such as COVID happens, which is once in a lifetime event. And this is where um, national registries um, and you know, population level registries have really given insight into what's been happening at the COVID-19 level. And I think you know, this sort of data gives real opportunities to look at patients, services, outcomes, both from a specialist service perspective, but also more granularly in the community. After all, the vast majority of the patients that we care for are patients in the community. They only spend a couple of days with us in secondary or tertiary care. And big data is important. So this is a quote that I like from one of your fellow Canadians, and it's only through the collection of big data um, and using them that you get sense. And this is really what's been happening in the United Kingdom. Um, so you can see that um, our first case um, in the United Kingdom was on the 28th of January. And the first mortality happened, um, I think on the 3rd of March. And you can see that there was initially an explosion of cases and the sort of peak were sort of between April and May when you know the country went into lockdown on the 23rd of March to try to contain this um, big pandemic. And then lockdown was released in June and you can see that the cases have declined. We're currently now in a second phase of um, an explosion of COVID. So there's very much discussion around um, and a further lockdown. Certainly there's been a number of local lockdowns in regions where their R rate is greater than one and increasingly people are discussing a further national lockdown because rate uh, cases have increased exponentially. Now it could be that you know we're, we're, we're testing much more vigorously than we were and perhaps that could partly contribute to the increase in cases. But certainly, if you look at hospitalizations, you know, there's over a thousand patients with COVID um, in hospital in the UK. And you can see that, the, you know, we are gradually increasing. And so we're having a doubling of COVID cases in the UK every six days currently, and it's increasing at an exponential rate. So it is a problem. So early on in March, um, the scientific advisory group um, for emergencies, SAGE, uh, um, contacted the National Institute of Cardiovascular Outcomes Research. So the scientific advisory group for emergencies is a group of scientists that's responsible um, for providing information and briefing the emergency cabinet office briefing room um, with scientific advice during national emergencies. And so, you know, the SAGE committee um, got together during COVID because it was considered to be a national emergency. And really, the SAGE committee approached the National Institute of Cardiovascular Outcomes Research and asked them um, for granular insight into what's happening with the population's cardiovascular health um, really to inform um, public policy um, of the UK government and also public health messages as well. And NICOR approached three academics to lead this. Um, they approached Colin Bajant at the University of Oxford, they approached Chris Gale at the University of Leeds, and they approached myself at the University of Kiel to analyse national data um, and provide input to their committee, which then they could then use that as the base of their decision making um, from the governmental health perspective. So to give you 
information about NICOR, what NICOR is. Um, so the National Institute of Cardiovascular Outcomes Research is a national audit, effectively, and it contains um, eight sub-audits. Um, two of them are disease-specific audits, so it has the Myocardial Infarction National Audit Project, so it's an audit of all MIs, and it's the largest such audit in the world. It has um, information from over 1.5 million uh, myocardial infarctions in the United Kingdom. There's also the National Heart Failure Audit, and that's about half a million patients admitted with heart failure. And these span you know, 10, 15 years back. It also has six treatment-specific audits. So it has a congenital heart disease audit, a PCI audit, um, which spans from about 2003. And in that, we have around 700,000 PCI procedures. There's a National Cardiac Surgery Audit, National Arrhythmia Audit, National Device Audit, and National TAVA Audit. And there's about 30,000 TAVA procedures uh, co contained within that. And the data that's collected from these audits um, are from hospital to discharge for one of these eight disease-specific conditions or treatment-specific conditions. And it contains information around clinical descriptions, indications for treatment, the sorts of treatments that we provide. It provides really granular information about the types of stents, the types of valves, uh, the timings of when they were produced, the complications and outcomes. And it also provides information around hospital infrastructure. And this work is used for national um, reporting. So in the UK, we had um, a scandal, the Bristol Heart Scandal, where um, it was found that on auditing, um, pediatric cardiac surgical case mortality was you know, very, very high. Um, and cardiac surgery um, services were stopped in Bristol. And really there was a governmental inquiry and as a result of this governmental inquiry, um, it was decided that, you know, that there has to be a form of audit whereby um, services can be benchmarked. And in particular, um, 10 conditions um, of which interventional cardiology is one has to have public reporting of individual operators with their outcomes, their case mix and what their predicted outcome should be. So my outcomes are reported you know, to the public as are every other interventional cardiologist's outcomes in the UK, as are every other cardiac surgeon's outcomes. And so, you know, we, we were the three people that were chosen to lead this, and we were given unprecedented access to NHS Digital. So NHS Digital is the governmental agency that provides and um, hosts digital care in the United Kingdom and a lot of the uh, data sets that are used. And they developed very quickly, within a matter of weeks, um, a, a digital workspace um, on their servers with all the necessary tools and research governments around that. And institutes such as NICOR um, uploaded their cardiac data onto these servers. The Office of National Statistics that captures mortality data loaded their data onto these servers as well and also all hospital level data um, that captures all admissions to hospitals in the united kingdom also um, loaded up their data and then myself and my group were given were seconded and we were employees of nhs digital our contracts will run out um, shortly although now given the secondary wave i suspect we're going to be asked to step up again and carry on with our analyses and so in the process of um, extending these contracts. And so then, you know, my analysts could um, access NHS Digital, link these longitudinal data that were being uploaded on a weekly basis often, and then make sense of it and produce reports and publications from it. And this led to um, this special um, national report um, that my group had a big part in leading the analysis uh, for that's publicly available and I'm happy to send the link or the report to anyone that's interested. So moving over to what we learned, um, in the UK there's been over 41,000 deaths and you know the peak was sort of April, May time when we were classically getting over a thousand COVID deaths a day. But that's really declined over the last couple of months. But again, over 
the last couple of weeks, we've started to see an exponential rise. And so, you know, we're, we're all wondering where the death rate will increase. And, you know, people are predicting that perhaps by November, there's going to be back to 200 deaths a day if we carry on with the current trajectory. You know, let's see, though. And, you know, you may think, well, okay, you know, 47,000 deaths in other parts of the world. Um, there's been a lot more deaths. And is that really the whole story? And, you know, it isn't. And I really want to share over the next 40 minutes or so what has been happening to cardiovascular care in the United Kingdom. And I think when we think about deaths from COVID, we need to think about, you know, direct deaths from COVID. Um, so patients getting infected with COVID, and many of these patients will have cardiovascular conditions, but also indirect effects. And so, you know, we and others have described that patients have avoided um, healthcare services because of the fear of catching COVID. We've also seen that to deal with COVID, there's been a massive restructure of cardiac services in the United Kingdom. So, pay, you know, staff being moved away from cardiac services into um, intensive care services, being asked to man ventilators, you know, losing cath lab nurses to work in other more high dependency areas of the hospital. There's also a risk of COVID co-infection. And unfortunately, you know, there, there are many patients that do get co-infection with COVID once admitted onto hospital wards. And finally, cessation of elective activity, because a government decree when the peak of COVID was happening was that all elective activity in the United Kingdom could stop so that we could, number one, protect the patients from getting co-infected with COVID, and number two, try to increase capacity for this tsunami of patients with COVID. And you know, stopping elective activity will have an impact on outcomes of patients. And I'm going to show you data around that. So first and foremost, you know, we, we can measure um, mortality, but is this excess mortality? And what my group has done was um, use statistical modelling based on data from the past decade and looked at what mortality should have been based on the last decade's data. And then we see what mortality should be. And you can see that um, there's been a big spike in deaths in all the regions in England over and above what would be expected based on historical averages over the past 10 years. And even if you take influenza outbreaks into an account, there's still a big excess risk of deaths. And, you know, as of between March and May, we estimated 47,000 excess deaths of which 37,000 were COVID deaths, but we also estimated around 10,000 um, excess non-COVID deaths, so deaths that we didn't think were related to COVID or didn't have um, a COVID positive uh, test. And these excess deaths seem to occur predominantly in older patients. So this is stratified by age. Um, and you can see that the vast majority of excess deaths were in the patient groups over the age of 65, with only a small blip um, of patients under 65 um, that's very difficult sometimes to differentiate from noise. But we also started to see interesting patterns emerging, and I think this is quite interesting data. Um, so we looked at where patients were dying. And we looked at you know, COVID deaths and non-COVID deaths. And the majority of excess deaths were COVID deaths. But we still saw a spike of non-COVID deaths. Now, interestingly, most of the COVID deaths were dying in hospital. Whereas a lot of the non-COVID deaths were happening in the home and in nursing homes as well, in care homes, hospices. And that's going to be quite important. And we'll get back to that a bit later. And we also looked at cardiovascular deaths. And again, we saw a spike of excess cardiovascular deaths in blue that wasn't related to COVID. And a lot of these excess cardiovascular deaths not related to COVID were happening in care homes, in hospices, and at home. And actually, the number of cardiovascular deaths occurring in hospitals was much less than expected. And so there's been a shift of deaths from the hospital to the hospice, to the community. And that's really interesting. And when you look at the cause of death, 
you can see that really the four biggest excess death causes were, again, strokes, acute coronary syndromes, heart failure, pulmonary embolus. So there was a great increase in the risk of death from these conditions, and this paper's coming out in heart, hopefully this week. But also that the place of the death had changed as well. So we were seeing a lot more strokes. All this excess death was happening in people's homes, in nursing homes. And again, for acute heart coronary syndrome, the same, heart failure the same, pulmonary embolus the same. And if anything, we were seeing a reduction in deaths from these conditions in hospital. And so what's that telling us or hinting at is that for some reason, we're getting a lot less deaths of these key four cardiovascular conditions in the hospital and an excess of deaths in the community, almost as if the patients are avoiding coming into hospital. And so really, you know, that, that's an important message. You know, we, we, we believe that patients have been avoiding coming into hospital. I'm going to show you some data that really shows this. And I think one of the drivers has been government messages, public health messages. So in, in the United Kingdom, even before the national lockdown on the 23rd of March, the message was very much, you know, stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives, don't go to hospital. And so patients, you know, were literally taking this and often, you know, we were seeing in clinical practice complications of MI that I hadn't seen for decades. I mean, we, we saw so many, you know, VSDs coming in. We saw lots of, you know, ruptured cordy, you know, things that I may see once every couple of years. And, you know, we were seeing them left, right and centre. And patients were literally staying at home trying to do their best to protect the NHS. And we can see that for heart failure. So, for example, this is data that was sent to me yesterday by one of my group, um, looking at two sources of heart failure um, admissions, the National Heart Failure Audit that I talked to you about, but also secondary care uh, hospital data. And you can see that even before the um, lockdown, um, the, so the line down here, you can see a marked reduction in heart failure admissions, which has recovered slightly, but it's still not back to baseline. And accompanying this, we've seen a reduction in heart failure deaths in hospital compared to previous years, but a marked increase in heart failure deaths at home and in care homes and hospices. And so what that's telling us is that, you know, patients with heart failure, you know, maybe a 50 odd percent, 60 percent reduction, 70 percent reduction in heart failure admissions um, to hospitals, but a big increase in heart failure deaths at home. People are staying away from hospitals. We also saw this in acute coronary syndrome. This is a paper published in The Lancet um, showing the, you know, the, the reduction in ACS admission um, markedly occurred, marked reductions by over half way before lockdown. You know, this messaging, stay at home, protect the NHS, is really literally keeping patients away from hospitals. And this is mainly for NSTEMI, but also STEMI we're seeing it. And it seems to be happening particularly in the older age groups and in patients um, with comorbidities. And those were really the patients that a lot of the messaging was going to, you know, the elderly, the comorbid, stay at home, protect the NHS. And the patients were literally taking that advice. This is a paper that, again, we published that further extended these observations um, recently. And this is using the National ACS audit, MINAP, and we found the 50% reduction in acute coronary syndrome. And we found that um, the reduction was mainly in the elderly and comorbid patients. There wasn't really much of a reduction in younger patients. It was more to do with the elderly patients that were keeping away. We also saw quite significant delays in presentation, both in the STEMI population, but also in the non-STEMI population in terms of symptom to presentation. We also saw changes in structure. You know, we were being far less aggressive in doing cath, particularly in NSTEMI patients. You know, the marked reduction in the receipt of coronary angiography for these patients. And we saw um, an increase in NSTEMI um, mortality during this period, perhaps related to the fact that we were being a lot less invasive in these patients. We were just trying to get them home so, to avoid the risk of um, co-infection. And we also looked at particular subgroups of patients. So this manuscript is currently under review. Um, so we looked at the BAME 
um, population. And we found that um, traditionally in the UK, around 10% of patients in the previous years admitted with an acute coronary syndrome have been vein patients. But then um, in the COVID period of this year, this has shot up to you know, 16, 70%. And these patients, again, that were BAME, were far less likely to be offered revascularization. Um, they have much greater um, mortality during the COVID period compared to the pre-COVID period, almost a doubling of mortality. Um, so, you know, the outcomes for these high-risk patients, such as BAME, that we know are particularly susceptible to COVID, was much worse than pre-COVID. Um, primary PCI, this is a paper that we published in Heart recently, being on call for primary PCI was really obvious, a, a marked reduction by about 50% of primary PCI. You know, patients were staying at home. Um, and you can see that uh, the, the, the rates, a number of procedures was fairly static in 2017, 18, 19, and then just plummeted in 2020 and way before the national lockdown of the 23rd of March. And patients were presenting later, you know, medium um, symptoms hospital on average 15 minutes later. And also the way that we structure healthcare, you know, we were trying to test patients for COVID, screen them before we took them to the cath lab, examine them more vigorously, so that even when they got to the front door, you know, the fact that we'd lost a lot of cath lab nurses, the door to balloon times had prolonged as well. Um, and you can see that, you know, particularly this was problematic in those patients um, with hospital transfer in that those patients particularly um, that were admitted to um, a spoke unit and then were transferred to our unit for primary PCI, big delays because, again, you know, they, they would have to make sure that this wasn't a COVID presentation. Um, that manifested as a STEMI, they'd come to us, we'd check again with all the PP and things, big delays. And certainly, you know, there, there, there is a trend towards worse outcome in these transfer patients. Um, and, you know, the numbers of transfer patients were relatively small, um, so the confidence intervals are pretty wide, but you can see there's definitely a signal there that these transfer patients have much worse outcome during the COVID pandemic. Although, you know, reassuringly, even with delays, those that did make it to hospital did have very similar outcomes to pre-COVID. So, you know, there wasn't an excess mortality um, associated with coming for primary PCI during the COVID pandemic. Patients still got a good quality of care. So I think the main findings up to now is first and foremost, um, I've demonstrated a marked reduction in um, presentation for a number of cardiovascular conditions, including acute coronary syndromes, uh, heart failure. We've got analyses showing exactly the same findings uh, for stroke that I haven't shown today. We've shown that the um, uh, that this is mainly occurring in older patients, comorbid patients. They tend to be coming much later to our services. We're managing these patients less invasively. And we're also seeing increases in, in hospital mortality, particularly for NSTEMI. And perhaps that's related to us not being so aggressive with our management. And we're also really seeing an excess in mortality of patients, of cardiovascular mortality. And this excess mortality has shifted from the hospital setting, where if anything, it's probably a bit lower, probably because patients aren't coming here anymore, to the community in the nursing homes um, where patients are not seeking medical attention. And in the nursing homes particularly, um, the people that run the nursing homes are not sending in patients to hospital for cardiac conditions and emergent cardiac conditions because of the fear that they'll bring COVID back into the nursing home. And so we're seeing a lot of excess mortality in these nursing homes. And it's really quite sad what's happened uh, there. So some nursing homes you know, that I know of, you know, half the patients have died um, from death during this COVID pandemic. Now, the other thing is that we've, I've shown you an increase of you know, deaths moving from hospitals to homes and nursing homes, but also, I think that this stay at home message has also relate, caused a delay in presentation of patients 
And so we've also seen an increase in out of hospital cardiac arrest. And this was accepted for publication in JAHA, um, and again by my group. And what you can see is that generally in the UK, around three, three and a half percent of patients in the acute coronary syndrome registry present with um, out of hospital cardiac arrest. And this has jumped to 5%, 6%, close to 7% during the COVID pandemic. And so clearly, you know, patients are not seeking medical treatment. And so being admitted afterwards without a hospital cardiac arrest. And you can see that, you know, even if you adjust for differences in baseline covariance, you know, the, the rates of, or the incident um, rate ratio has increased by almost twofold um, from what would be expected. And you can see that um, the patients um, that present are older, um, they're much more likely to be BAME patients and they're, you know, particularly the elderly patients are exactly the ones that are staying away. And we've also changed how we're managing these patients with out of hospital cardiac arrest. You can see that the number of proportion of patients that we take to cath lab has markedly decreased. And I think part of it is through concerns, you know, particularly at the start of the pandemic, we, like many other places in North America, did not have access to adequate PPE. I mean, we were being expected to manage COVID patients with surgical masks and plastic aprons at the start. Um, and so there was a concern, particularly for intubated patients, you know, aerosol generating procedures, whether, you know, these patients were COVID positive. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, patients without hospital cardiac arrest receive suboptimal care because, you know, it's very clear, you know, only 30% of them were being taken to cath lab, whereas traditional in the years previously, you know, 60, 70% were being taken to cath lab. Um, and this is reflected really by outcomes in that the in-hospital outcomes are much worse during the COVID period compared to non-COVID period. I also think that um, not only changes in patients avoiding hospitals, change in the way that we deliver care in terms of who gets a cath, I think there's also been changes in the risk of COVID infection, um, and that's been particularly impactful on our patients. And this is some data that we're trying to publish around um, COVID positive ACS patients. Now it's not clear to me or the other researchers when we've been linking all these different um, electronic healthcare records. Uh, so in this case, we're using hospital episode records linked to um, Office of National Statistics mortality records linked to the National ACS audit. Um, so we're using bit sources of information from different registries um, to capture the outcomes of the patients and the COVID status of the patients. And you can see that the um, incidence or the, the prevalence of COVID positivity in um, ACS patients is around 4% in this registry. And it was peaking at the time of um, lockdown. And it's not clear to me whether these patients you know, had COVID in the community, whether they caught it in hospital. It's probably a mixture of both. And it seems to be you know, similar um, in STEMI and in NSTEMI. And generally, these patients tended to be um, much older. They tended to be much more likely to be BAME. Um, and they used to present a lot more sicker. So this registry um, is around 600 patients from memory, maybe 500 patients. And it's the largest COVID positive ACS registry in the world currently. Um, we've put it on Mediric, so it's freely available um, to cardiovascular researchers or clinicians anywhere that can look at this. And, you know, even after adjustment for baseline covariates, you know, these patients had really bad outcomes. So their 30 day mortality was something like 40%. And even if you adjust for the fact they're more likely to be out of hospital arrest, more likely to be elderly, you can see that their, you know, 30 day adjusted mortality is sixfold greater than non COVID positive ACS. Um, Again, for STEMI and STEMI, similar sorts of findings. And even those that underwent PCI, so it's not driven by the fact we're not taking these patients for PCI, even COVID positive PCI patients in the setting of an acute coronary syndrome that get taken to the cath lab, um, their mortality rate is around 30% and the 30 day, um, odds of 30 day mortality is ninefold greater than um, 
COVID negative patients. The other thing that we've looked at are causes of death. And I'm doing that for a number of conditions, but the work that has really been much more advanced is um, following PCI. Um, and what we've done here is linked na the National PCI Registry with the National Death Registry in the United Kingdom. Um, and the National Death Registry is very accurate, so it's a legal requirement to report death um, within seven days of death in the UK, and that, that data is uploaded with maybe a week, two weeks lag. So you know, my group can see any death occurring in England uh, that's occurred up to two weeks previously and we see that for everybody in the UK and we, we look at 30-day causes of death and it's really quite interesting because the first thing that you see and this is you know similar information elsewhere this is the first time anyone's looked at it in the United Kingdom cardiac deaths following PCI only account for 60% of deaths and yet we use um, you know, 30 day mortality as a quality metric for PCI, we use it for benchmarking. And yet only half of the deaths that we see are cardiac related. Um, and that's, you know, quite interesting, you know, many patients may die from cancers will die from infections, and often the deaths may have nothing to do with the PCI procedure. And for procedures on very elderly patients, such as TAVA patients who by virtue of the fact that these individuals are much more elderly, much more comorbid, um, often in their 80s, you know, their, their background risk of mortality is pretty high to begin with. Um, and so again, you know, using 30-day mortality you know, for benchmarking services, I think becomes more difficult, particularly for the competing risk of mortality in these elderly populations. Now, the thing that I'm quite interested in is that during the COVID period, one in 10 patients after a PCI at 30 days died from COVID. Now, this is going to really cause a problem, and I'm not sure how we're going to address this problem in that um, the, the, the problem is going to be that a lot of our risk, well, all, of, all, all the risk models were never developed to take into account 10% of deaths being caused by COVID. Um, and so for national reporting, you know, if you start doing TAVRs or PCI and your unit has, you know, starts being shown to be performing worse than what the model will predict, is it really because your unit is, is performing worse? Or is it because, you know, for whatever reason, you have a much higher COVID rate in your state compared to, say, another state? Um, and I think, you know, working out what we're going to do about this is going to be challenging. Um, my group is now looking at the performance of many of the risk models that we've helped develop, um, or we've developed, in fact, for TAVR and PCI during the COVID pandemic, and particularly looking at, you know, calibration, the drift, and so forth, to see whether, you know, the tools that we use for um, prediction of outcomes are applicable in the COVID period, and certainly COVID's not going to go away. Um, and when one in ten of the procedures that you undertake, or the one in ten of the deaths of the procedures that you undertake is due to COVID, then certainly I think that puts a big question mark around national reporting. Um, and again, you can see you know, lots of different causes. They're, they're fairly similar, apart from you know ten percent, so one in ten of all deaths following PCI at thirty days relate to COVID infection. And I don't know whether this is, you know, cross infection in the hospital, whether it's um, infection in the community, whether the patients had infection prior to admission, but certainly you know, the 10% rate is there in elective patients. So even if you take out um, patients with acute coronary syndrome and elective admissions, one in 10 of the deaths will be related to COVID. And so that to me, you know, brings a lot of question marks around cross-infection um, and public reporting. And finally, I want to talk maybe for the last 10 minutes around the impact that, I guess, policy has had on um, outcomes during COVID. Certainly in the UK um, and many where else places, um, there was an expectation in March that our health services were going to be inundated. So the NHS runs at about 90%, 95% um, hospital occupancy. 
And so there's not really a lot of flexibility in the system, particularly when you know, hundreds of thousands of patients are being diagnosed with COVID and tens of thousands of patients are being admitted with COVID. And so you know, some of the solutions involved uh, the military uh, using big conference centers as um, hospitals, so field hospitals, so the Nightingale Ward after Florence Nightingale, the NEC in London, um, in Birmingham, in Manchester, and um, these three big um, conference venues were taken, you know, the military took over the running of them. Then um, many of my colleagues were seconded um, to these units to try to take, you know, to, to provide backup for capacity. And thankfully, you know, we didn't really use them, um, but you know, the capacity was there. We didn't know what the problem was gonna be. And also, we, the government said that you know, we have to cancel elective services. You know, it was announced that all elective services and less emergencies should be cancelled. Um, and that's had a huge impact on cancer services and cardiovascular services. And they've been cancelled for a number of reasons. Number one, to you know, help with capacity for treating COVID patients. But number two, to protect the patients, particularly given that many of the patients that undergo elective cardiac procedures are the highest risk patients. And this is data that we submitted as of yesterday for publication. Um, so we've looked at hospital episode um, statistics or hospital activity in England, looking at different procedural volumes in 2018, 19 and 2020 for different procedures. And you can see that across the board, whether it's bypass operations, 70% reduction, Cardiac catheterization, 60% reduction. PCI, 30% reduction. Um, you know, TAVRs, big reductions. Um, EP ablations, 65% reductions. Um, you know, all sorts of um, cases being impacted. You know, devices, big reductions. And you can see that we estimate um, that during between March and May, and remember now we're in September, just between March and May. Um, we're 45,000 procedures below what we should be. Now, you may think, well, okay, you know, is that going to have a prognostic impact to patients? And I think it will do. I mean, if you think about it, you know, patients with aortic stenosis, patients with arrhythmias undergoing, you know, BT ablations, patients needing devices changing or devices implanted because of new indications um, with heart failure following post AMI, um, it, it's going to impact on us. And to, you know, to give you an example, we, we've also been looking at the outcomes associated with these procedures. And certainly for cardiac catheterization and for cardiac devices, we seem to see an increase in 30-day mortality for these procedures. Now, I, I don't know why that is, whether it's because we don't have granularity in this data set around you know, lesion characteristics um, we, we, or why the device is being changed or any procedural information about the device. Um, I mean, we've adjusted for age, sex, comorbidity as defined by Charles and all the other cardiovascular risk factors and other risk factors, but we, we, we still see this excess mortality, whether it's real, whether it's just that um, higher risk patients are being admitted during this period for their procedures, who knows? And really the exemplar, the last five minutes of um, what's happened to cardiac surge of services is really the treatment of aortic stenosis. Um, we all know that aortic stenosis in this, if left untreated has, you know, a very high mortality rate. So 90% of patients will have died um, at the end of two years if they have symptomatic aortic stenosis and remain untreated. And we can treat aortic stenosis with surgical AVR um, and TAVA, uh, trans um, aortic valvular um, interventions, or TAVI we call it in the UK, are basically um, a valve on a stent that we deploy through the leg. Um, and initially this procedure was undertaken for patients not fit enough for the SAVA procedure. Whereas now with a um, number of landmark partner trials, we're moving into lower, initially high risk and intermediate risk and now low risk patients. And this is what we see in the UK for aortic stenosis treatment. So um, these are the blue curves are the um, non-elective 
the red curves are the electives. And you can see there's been an absolute collapse or a massive reduction in um, isolated aortic valve replacement, AVR and cabbage, AVR and other valve interventions, and TAVA as well. So across the board, the way we're treating aortic stenosis is marked reduction. Um, and there hasn't really been a change in the risk profile of the patients that we're treating, perhaps apart from TAVI. Um, and the reason for that is that we've moved in the UK and elsewhere internationally from just treating um, patients that wouldn't be fit for surgery to nowadays treating low risk patients. Um, and this is, you know, statistical modelling, what we would observe and what has been predicted. And so, we, you know, we would have expected a big increase in TAVA um, over time with probably a gradual decline of AVR um, over time. Um, and that's what many places in healthcare systems see that many of the AVR work done by the surgeons is moving now towards TAVA. And you can see that if you just look at observed minus predicted, whether it's AVR, whether it's TAVA, whether it's AVR and cabbage, you know, big reductions in a number of procedures per month. Um, thankfully, though, for the ones that we have undertaken um, in the UK, so even though the procedure numbers are down, um, the fact that we do it during the peak of the COVID pandemic, it's safe. Um, certainly, when you use logistic Euroscore to predict you know, what the outcome should be, you know, our, our outcomes in the UK are no different to what they should be. And when we use the TAVA risk score that my group has developed for national reporting, again, no different. So certainly, you know, doing, treating these patients that are elderly isn't associated with an increased risk um, for the ones treated during the COVID pandemic. But this is where it gets problematic because we estimate that there's been, you know, something well over 2,000 patients now in the UK up to June that haven't had um, treatment for aortic stenosis. And we know from this um, landmark um, work that even waiting 80 days, you have something like a 2 to 3% mortality for untreated aortic stenosis just on the waiting list and a 10% risk of heart failure hospitalizations. And, you know, even if we go back to 50% capacity, we'll still have something like 1,700 patients waiting for aortic valve surgery at 80 days. And that doesn't even take into account new referrals. And so, you know, we estimate there's probably going to be anywhere between 40 and 300 um, excess deaths because of these waiting lists because we're not able to get patients in treated for their aortic stenosis and these calculations you know didn't even take into account the impending lockdown that we're going to have now in the united kingdom with this second wave increasing and so really what i would say and if you're not doing this already you really need to think about I and mean, we've been thinking about reconfiguration of services in the short term and we've been doing that for left main you know, moving a lot of the patients that would have otherwise been surgical to PCI. And again, for severe aortic stenosis, I think, you know, now, you know, we really have to think about shifting many of the patients that would have been isolated surgical ABR patients towards TAVA and perhaps focusing activity in those that um, are SAVA and another valve or SAVA and cabbage. Because I think if we don't, if we're not reactive to these, this big impact and this huge waiting list of patients, you know, there's, there's going to be a big mortality impact. So I think in conclusions, using the big data approach where, you know, my group has been able to access national data that we can link ourselves almost live. Um, so the data that we are accessing is generally between a week to a month maximum. Um, so the for the national cardiac registries it's usually every month that they upload a new data set for us for the hospital episode data every four or five weeks for the mortality data every week or so um, we're really able to get real life um, insight into what's happening to cardiovascular care and i think well i hope i've shown you that patients really are avoiding um hospitalization um that they are you know, there's been a lot of excess cardiovascular deaths in the community, in the nursing homes and at home. 
I think there's been changes in the management of conditions such as out of hospital arrest. Um, there's been a change in the structure of services, um, particularly in aortic stenosis. Uh, that's going to have an impact on our patients, an impact that we, perhaps hasn't really been considered during COVID. And I think that there has been an increased risk of COVID co-infection. Um, certainly patients um, that do get infected with COVID that have cardiovascular disease do very badly, 40% 30-day mortality in ACS patients. And I think from a public reporting perspective, I think it's going to throw some real challenges to us in that how do we account for this excess mortality associated with COVID infection. You know, many of the patients that die following elective or emergent procedures die because of COVID deaths. You know, how will we take that into account when undertaking public reporting? And in particular, you know, will this be labelling units or operators as performing out of um, expected expectation or underperforming, whereas in fact they're performing you know, adequately, it's just that in their region, they're treating patients with a very high background risk of COVID. Um, so I'd like to thank you for joining me um, and I'm open to questions, so thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Mamas, that was uh, great. Uh, let me ask you a couple of things because uh, one of the things that I did notice and you showed this very nice uh, fig, uh, slides showing the potential of a second wave that you already are having, yes. but the mortality doesn't seem to be tracking that. Yes. So my question would be, uh, is this because, you know, now we do have some treatments like dexamethasone, remdesivir, have you factored that into that mortality? No, so I think the, the mortality question is very interesting. We, I haven't shown the data today, but we analysed every single death in the United Kingdom um, during the COVID pandemic, whether it was COVID or non-COVID. Um, and the first thing to say is, whilst we're all fixated about um, COVID deaths, you're more, five times more likely in each age group, even the very elderly, to die from something else than of COVID. The only thing that I would say is that if you look at the individual causes of death, COVID is the top cause of death for all age group apart from younger women where it's cancer. The reason as to why the mortality rate is lower, I think it's because now we're seeing this second wave not in the elderly population, um, but rather in the much younger population. So what we're seeing is, you know, these younger guys going out, going to bars, the middle-aged people, they're the ones getting infected and their rates of mortality are much, much, much lower than the very elderly that we were seeing, particularly in the nursing homes that were dying. Yeah, now the other question is, um, you did show that a lot of this is also heart failure. Yes. So should we be doing something into improving our remote management of heart failure and maybe some apps and things like that to improve treatment of heart failure out of hospital? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we should. Um, and I think one of the, I mean, I guess you can't say there's huge advantages to COVID, but I think one of the few advantages is that it's really brought telemedicine to a forefront. Whereas if you'd have told me, oh, you'll be doing telephone follow-up clinics over the phone and over, you know, the Teams and other platforms, I'd would have thought you'd be mad a couple of years ago, whereas now it's the norm for many of us. Um, I think that using telehealth, so for example, um, utilizing the functionality of many of the devices that people implant, so for example, Optival or these AF, AF Finder apps and you know, constructing services that are responsive to that in devices, I think is a win-win. I think the bigger problem, though, to my mind, is not the management of chronic heart failure. It's that patients with acute heart failure syndromes are not coming into hospital. We've seen a big, big reduction in acute heart failure syndrome patients and this excess heart failure death. And so it's really reframing the public health message and not saying, you know, protect the NHS, stay at home, save lives, but saying, you know, if you have these symptoms, you need to come in your risk of catching COVID is low, 
and the outcomes from the treatment of your condition are no different to pre-COVID. Yeah, right. There are a couple of questions here on the chat. So one from Dr. Smith, that is what percent of COVID patients who die do so because of cardiovascular disease causes? So that's, I, I can tell you from the, the data that we've published in Mayo Clinic Proceedings that um, something like 30% of patients who die have a cardiovascular contributory cause on the death certificate. So they have a cardiovascular comorbidity on the death certificate. I, I don't know whether that contributed or you know it's just there on the death certificate. Um, hypertension around 50%, diabetes around 20% of the patients that die with COVID. When you compare um, COVID deaths and non-COVID deaths, they have very different phenotypes in terms of their contributing conditions. So for example, in the non-COVID deaths, we see a lot more um, cancers contributing to the deaths, whereas for the COVID deaths, it seems to be things like dementia, hypertension, coronary heart disease. Um, and you, when you look at the different ages, you can see very different um, patient phenotypes in terms of their contributory factors for COVID and non-COVID deaths. Um, so I can't give you an exact number, but I can say that they do have a very different phenotype and one particularly towards a cardiovascular phenotype in those that die from COVID. And there was another question there that if you consider COVID-19 as a massive viral myocarditis, a cause of uh, acute heart failure death, and would you recommend CMR for all COVID-19 positive patients without cardiac symptoms? No, <laughs> I wouldn't consider a CMR for COVID-19 patients without um, cardiac symptoms. I guess that's in reference to the JAMA cardiology paper from Ike Nigel and his group um, that's yeah. getting a lot of discussion on social media. In terms of, I mean, you know, COVID's presenting very interestingly, and we often see cases where, you know, I'm not sure it's a classical myocarditis. We often see cases that come to cath lab and you think this is definitely a STEMI. You, you, you look at it, the ECG's there, you think 100% a STEMI, you do the cath, there's nothing there. And interestingly, I was on another um, COVID Zoom conference um, for one of the meetings coming up um, with um, um, Valentin Fuster um, and Renu Vermani as well. So the three of us were discussing. And what they showed was autopsy data from these patients that were labeled as myocarditis. And actually what they had was lots of microthrombi in the microvascular disease. And so, you know, these patients aren't classical myocarditis, it's just sort of, you know, these thrombotic manifestations plugging up um, the microvasculature within the myocard myocardium, giving a STEMI type presentation. And one of the things that we've also been doing is looking at arteriovenous thromboembolic causes of death. And what we found during the COVID period there's something like a 70 to 80% increase above what would be expected, particularly around pulmonary embolus, deep vein thrombosis. And I guess, you know, that's similar to what many places have seen. You know, on social media, you see these echo images of people coming in with so-called myocarditis and their ventricles are full of thrombus. And, you know, we're really aggressive now in, um, you know, treating these patients, um, anyone that's COVID positive, you know, using treatment dose, um, anticoagula uh, anticoagulants and NOACs, particularly for those whose D-dimers are elevated because of the high risk of thrombotic complications that we, we and others are reporting. Yeah, well, thanks, that was uh, great. I don't know if there's any other questions. Uh, I don't see anything else. Well, again, Mamas, thank you very much for a great presentation and uh, We'll catch up a little bit later. Stay yeah. safe. Yeah, thanks. Take care. Take care. Bye now. Bye.